they're so big so long i've <laughs> never heard them called bricks before that's hilarious so today we're going to be checking out a channel called basics daily who created a video called the rise of the usa by peter zenehan zaihan by peter zaihan i'm not familiar with this channel but i'll leave the link in the description box below so do go check it out for yourself I appreciate when people take the time to make these videos and I appreciate if you go check out the original video in its original format. I'm curious what direction this video is gonna go in, particularly toward the end. It's gonna be super interesting. For today's comment, if you can't think of something to say about the video, let me know what your most expensive grocery product is in the comments below that will feed the algorithm monster and keep it from banging on my door. You can also check out patreon.com slash Jennings to get early music reactions and lots of behind the scenes stuff of me and my life and other things. Where to start when discussing the United States? With the fact that the Americans inherited the best lands in the world for a very low price in terms of blood, treasure, and time. The fact that within North America, there are barriers that separated the early Americans from rival populations in Canada and Mexico. That the territory of the United States is better suited to deep water navigation than even Great Britain, and better suited to industrialization than even Germany. That throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, the Europeans were so studiously building toward their wars of self-annihilation that they had little attention to spare for oh the young country God. that would so soon eclipse them. But while these- Peter! Yeah? yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Did you mean- This is all very negative. Advantages are indeed overwhelming from a global perspective. They are actually secondary. Okay. There is another factor in play that all but dictates the United States' global dominance its waterway network. The Mississippi is the world's longest navigable river. From this point on, the term navigable river refers to rivers that can handle drafts of nine feet for at least nine months of the year. Some 2,100 miles long from its mouth at the Gulf of Mexico to its head of navigation at the Twin Cities in Minnesota. That's about one third longer than the mighty Danube and triple the length of the Rhine. Gotta say, I am appreciating how well made this video is so far. Very beautiful shots, well edited. And the Mississippi is one of only 12 major navigable American rivers. Collectively, all of America's temperate zone rivers are 14,650 miles long. China and Germany each have about 2,000 miles. France about 1,000. The entirety of the Arab world has but 120. Yet there is more to America's waterways than just its rivers. The Americans benefit from a geographic feature that exists in few other places on the planet and nowhere else in such useful arrangements. Barrier islands. Chains of these low, flat, long islands parallel the American mainland for over three quarters of the Gulf and East Coasts. The American barrier island chain turns 3,000 miles of exposed coastline into dozens of connected shielded bays, huh. allowing for safe navigation from the Chesapeake to the Texas-Mexican border. The net effect of this intracoastal waterway is the equivalent of having a bonus 3,000 mile long river. The most compelling feature of the American maritime system, however, is also nearly unique among the world's waterways. The American system is indeed a network the Mississippi has six major navigable tributaries, most of which have several of their own. The Greater Mississippi System empties into the Gulf of Mexico at a point where ships have direct access to the barrier island and intercoastal systems. All told, this Mississippi and intercoastal system accounts for 15,500 of the United States' 17,600 miles of internal waterways. Even leaving out the United States' and North America's other waterways, Whoa. this is still a greater length of internal waterways than the rest of the planet combined. The result is that the United States has the greatest volume and concentration of capital generation opportunities in the world by an absolutely massive margin. And that opportunity is very heavily concentrated in a single unified system. The combination of size and interconnectedness of the system dictates a number of outcomes. Any culture based upon those waterways will be ridiculously capital rich. When it comes to transport, distance is key. Low costs of transport allow goods to be shipped farther. And the more efficiently you can move goods from areas of high supply to areas of high demand, the greater the range at which your goods are competitive. That was a huge thing I noticed in the United States. 
how freaking long your cargo trains are like in insanely long like to the point that you could be sitting there a very long time waiting for one to pass we don't have anything approaching that size that i have seen in europe like they're so big so long in the american example this allows goods whether nebraska corn or tennessee whiskey or texas oil or new jersey steel or georgia peaches or michigan cars to reach anywhere in the river network at near nominal costs without having to even leave the country. Volume of those extra savings makes the United States the most capital rich location on the planet. And that money can be used for whatever Americans or their government want from iPhones to aircraft carrier battle groups. One of the things that the Americans have traditionally not needed to spend that money on is artificial infrastructure. In most countries, the geopolitical necessity of infrastructure is a core motivator for government formation and expansion, with Germany being the quintessential example. Roads and rails do not come cheaply, so taxes need to be raised and government workforces formed. Not so in the United States. The rivers directly and indirectly eliminate many barriers to economic wow. entry and keep development costs low. Even the early smallholders, pioneer families who owned and worked their own plots of land, found themselves able to export grain via America's waterways within a matter of months of breaking ground. It's a recipe for small government and high levels of entrepreneurship. It also means that as the United States developed, it was able to lay rail and road networks to supplement its pre-existing river network, as well as open up new inland territories that lacked maritime transport options. Hmm. These new artificial transport systems did somewhat displace rivering transport, but the constant competition that river transport provides for other modes keeps a lid on transport costs regardless of method. The American geography is also a recipe for a consumer base that is absolutely massive. If government is limited, then tax burdens are low, leaving more money in the citizenry's pockets. If capital is readily available, then so is credit, enabling consumers and corporations alike the ability to expand with ease. If moving products from place to place is easy, food can reach areas that cannot provide enough themselves. Wow. It thus makes sense to specialize, so and specialization steadily improves education, output, and income levels. The more people specialize, the larger, more sophisticated, and interlinked the economy becomes. The United States is far and away the world's largest consumer market and has been since shortly after the Civil War. As of 2014, that consumer base amounts to roughly $11.5 trillion. That's Jeez. triple anyone else, larger than the consumer base of the next six countries, Japan, Germany, the United Kingdom, France, China, and Italy, combined, and double that of the combined BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Rivers I've promote- never heard, I've and never they, heard them called BRICS before. That's hilarious. Integrated maritime network promotes unity over a far larger swath of territory. Low-cost transport encourages economic and social interaction along the transport routes. The greater the level of specialization, the greater the need for that interaction. If your city produces cars, it probably needs to import steel, electronics, food, lumber, and so on. Such mutual dependence rapidly takes on characteristics that far surpass the purely economic. Deep, multifaceted economic linkages quickly generate deep, multifaceted cultural and political linkages. With the most robust, naturally occurring infrastructure, it should come as little surprise that the United States enjoys one of the strongest national identities of the major powers. In most cases, international linkages don't achieve the same sort of cultural interaction because personal interaction doesn't occur very often. It's the combination of personal accessibility and economic interdependence that puts a rivering culture on the path to unification. It should come as little surprise that the portion of early America that was least integrated was the South. That region's rivers flow directly to the sea in a manner similar to Northern Europe, resulting in somewhat localized rather than federalized entities. That's super interesting. Similarly, today it is notable that the Pacific Coast states often seem culturally out of step with everyone east of the Rockies. That region is the one portion of the United States in which integration with foreign nations is of similar difficulty to integration internally. That, and next door Vancouver, is awesome. America's waterways have is created a Vancouver? legacy of extreme capital richness, remarkable political unity, and a powerful consumer-driven economy, all on a scale that makes the United States the outlier in a global context. 
And all that with a government that is relatively small in personnel and resources for a country of its size. Okay, it definitely honed in on a thing, like a specific thing. I didn't think it was going to do that, but it was super interesting. And something I never thought about before, but it's so freaking true. You have all those land masses. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Never thought of it before. Very interesting. Good diction on that fellow, Briggs. Very well spoken. Is he from Vancouver?